Uh, okay, thanks. So we can start now. Um, so thank you everyone for being here today, um, especially to our awesome speakers that are here to present their uh, work, uh, their current research work and to offer uh, to students some uh, uh, research thesis internship opportunities. Um, so this is the second part of our AI2S research fair. For those of you that weren't there the last time, um, uh, AI2S is a new association, a new student association that wants to um, put together basically the student uh, community here in Trieste uh, working on topics ranging from uh, uh, artificial intelligence to data science to uh, scientific computing basically and uh, uh, because of that we want to provide services to our future members for now and uh, uh, those kind of services concern also the possibility of doing uh, those kind of uh, internship or thesis so we try to put together professors and students to make life easier for both um, so how this event will uh, will uh, go on basically is going to be uh, some presentations from our speakers. Uh, we'll have uh, in order Professor uh, Lorenzo Castelli, uh, after that we have uh, Professoressa Laura Nenzi, after that Professor Luca Heltai, after that Professor Luca Manzoni and uh, finally Professor Leonardo Egidi. At the end of all the presentations that are going to be roughly 15 minutes each, uh, we're going to have a meet and greet session. So as last time, for those of you who were there last time, we have a link to a page where you can find all the links uh, that bring you to individual chat rooms, basically, where you can talk with the professor that you're interested in, basically, for uh, the thesis or other projects. So um, I think that without further ado, I would leave the, the field to Professor Castelli. Professor Castelli is an assistant professor, uh, an associate professor, sorry, in, in uh, operation research at the University of Trieste. Hello, yes, so thank you very much. Um, it's interesting to see that all the speakers today, the first name starts with L, Lorenzo, Luca, Luca, Laura, and Leonardo. That's an amazing thing. Uh, by the way, I'm going to share now uh, the screen. Uh, you should, someone is already sharing because one participant can share at a time. Uh, yeah, okay. Share. All right. So you should, can you see that? Okay. So yeah, it works. Uh, I see uh, some, of the, some of the people attending um already know what, what i'm going to present because they follow my course uh during this uh, second semester so kertana uh, Luisuto, and other people so uh, my apologize because uh I, I did some of the things here uh already uh, they, they they know about but most of you don't know anything so so first of all uh, i'm going to talk about uh, the activities of the uh, operation research lab here at the university of, uh, of uh, trieste so what is operation research another name is mathematical optimization or mathematical programming so basically uh, we have a function we want to find the minimum or the maximum of this real function normally it's a, it's a real function uh and the the key thing is that we don't talk about unconstrained optimization but normally you talk about constraints so the variables are bound to belong to to a set so uh which is normally called the feasible region um so it, it's something which everybody knows so it's a you have met in your life so many times you want to find the minimum or the maximum on a given on a given function so um the basically we we have a set of, uh, uh, some alternatives and among these alternatives, some of them, the subset F is uh, the set of the feasible alternatives. And this is why it's called the feasible set. Uh, those who are not in F, uh, they are called infeasible. And uh, uh, the relationship between X and uh, belonging to F is the, the, the constraint. And what you want to do is to find the minimum or the maximum on a given function, uh, where the domain is F and normally is a real function. So uh, this is what you want to do. 
so this is something uh, which is, I think, very known to you. Uh, and the, we want to find an optimal solution. So the optimal solution, basically, uh, among all the elements that you have in the feasible set, uh, we want to find the one that uh, takes the minimum value if you want to minimize, or otherwise the maximum value if you want to maximize. There might be more than one optimum, of course, uh, but we need to find at least one. Uh, and this is the, 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 the optimal solution. Okay, this is my last slide with some uh, notation, mathematical notation, don't worry. But this was just to give you an idea, a very broad idea on what uh, operational research of mathematical optimization is. Um, the, the fact is that we, when you talk about uh, constraint optimization, um, and normally uh, it, it's, it's not so easy that you can have, because you can have a convex uh, optimization, uh, the objective function is convex, uh, the feasible set is convex, uh, but you can have non-convex. Uh, and within the convex, we have linear of, uh, programming uh, or linear optimization where everything is linear. The objective function is linear, all the constraints are linear, uh, and, uh, uh, and this is continuous. But you can also have uh, integer linear programming where the variables are discrete. So, uh, and for each of these possibilities, uh, you, you need to find uh, appropriate algorithms uh, that allows you to, to find this optimal solution. So it's not an easy task. Uh, normally, linear programming is uh, what you study in an uh, introductory course of uh, operation research, which is in Italian is a ricerca operativa. Uh, and then, uh, if you don't know how to solve the linear programming, so the continuous uh, part, you are not able to solve the integer linear programming, and you are not able to solve the non-integer, so the non-linear, uh, and, and so on. And then you might have some specific cases where they are defined as a quadratic programming, so objective function is quadratic, but so it's uh, it, it, it's it's nonlinear at the beginning, but you can move uh, to uh, some uh, with some modification with trans uh, transformation. You you can reduce this to a linear programming problem. So um, it, it's even at the beginning it can seem easy. Uh, what I want to find is to find the minimum or the maximum of a function on a on a set, uh, depending on the characteristics. Uh, that can be uh, really really tricky. Um, and uh, uh, sorry. And, and, uh, and uh, for instance, as I said, you need to find some good algorithms to find the optimum. Uh, the, the ideal is, is to find the exact optimum. Uh, so uh, this might not be always the case. It is easy if everything is continuous uh, and linear. Even if something, if you have uh, linear constraints, linear objective function, but the decision variables, uh, the variables is, uh, is not continuous, but it, it, it is discrete. So you can have binary variables, you can have integer variables. Uh, you may not be able to find an exact solution um, uh, because uh, maybe some of you know something about uh, complexity. Uh, many of these problems are called to be NP-hard, uh, then meaning that for which there is no uh, knowledge of the existence of uh, algorithms that can find the optimal solution in polynomial time. Um, so uh, that uh, the the I, Oh, what's going on here? So the, the idea would be to find an exact algorithm uh, that allows you to find the, the real optimal solution, but it might not uh, be the case. Then you can have approximate algorithms. Uh, normally, you don't know which is the optimum, but uh, you know which is the error, the maximum error that you can have in finding the solution. You, you, find, uh, you can find fast this uh, solution, but uh, uh, you don't know whether this is the optimum or not but you slightly know how far you are from this optimum. And then you have meta heuristics, as most of you know, you have algor uh, genetic algorithms. Um, this is a meta heuristics, uh, or I don't know, uh, hand colony, uh, simulating annealing and, and so on. This is a classes of heuristics. You can have heuristics for a given problem, uh, but you don't even know which is the error. Okay, so there are, they can, could be fast, but uh, you are still uh, it's less precise in terms of finding the optimal solution. So um, the, the, the question is, I don't know what is this here. So do, do, we, do we know a, a, everything from, from the, uh, the beginning? Um, normally, no. Uh, if you know everything, it will be a deterministic optimization uh, when there is no uncertainty. Um, but you know that in real life, uh, uh, you might have a lot of uncertainty and then you can distinguish between stochastic programming, robust optimization, and how to link optimization and machine learning. 
Uh, in, in my course of optimization model, uh, we basically did, we, we only do some deterministic optimization and just with a flavor of stochastic and robust, uh, stochastic programming and robust optimization to just a few uh, words, just to let people know what is this, uh, uh, this about. Uh, and then of course the role, the interplay between uh, optimization machine learning, this is a, a quotation from a book which was uh, 10 years ago already, but it is absolutely uh, true even today and will be more and more uh, the links between the, the two big fields. It's, uh, it's definitely really high. So mm -hmm. I'm going to, to be uh, fast. Um, the, the, the operational research starting uh, before the war at, uh, in the United K, the, the name is operational research. Uh, and, and the idea was to find um, the right location from the radars uh, that uh, RAF had to place in order to uh, prevent uh, the, the um, to, 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 to prevent the, the German uh, ex war exercises. So, uh, and they invented this uh, this word, operational research. And still, the UK government has a, a, a section which is called the Government Operational Research Service, and a former student of mine is there now, and it is called the Operational Research Gov UK. So uh, this link, it's a, it's a, uh, it just for, we don't have time, but I will leave these uh, uh, slides for you for references. So if you want, you can have a look to this, uh, to this link. And what they say here that operational research brings intellectual rigor to the decision-making process. So you want to formalize, you, you need to find some decision, you have to find the optimal decision, and you know how to formalize to make it in a mathematical way. Um, let me do to some competitors. So what the Swiss Data Science Center says, uh, this is a, a, a big uh, data science center between APFL and ATH. And you can see here when they talk about data science, one, uh, there is many things, uh, that uh, data mining and uh, machine learning, algorithms and so on. And one, the bricks uh, that build a data science is also operational research, right? So uh, we are in a good company. Uh, uh, that's, uh, this is why I think it's really um, good for you to know what is this about. Um, I, I'm, I'm not going to read that. So just there is hundreds of thousands of applications uh, in the real life, in production planning, stock management, uh, sizing plans, then you can have, uh, these slides will be available to you, so you can have a look if you want. Uh, and uh, you have the network design, the structural design, uh, and many, many other things. So this is an optimal design, but this is economic and finance, uh, the choice of investment, so, and uh, the composition of portfolios. Uh, we have project planning, uh, staff shift, for instance, that's very important, vehicle routing, routing is, uh, you, you, you want to know how to route a given vehicle for, to visit its customers, and uh, it's um, very popular, uh, there are very popular problems which are addressed and solved in uh, basically in real time. Uh, and then we have systems biology, uh, medical diagnosis, and, uh, and so on. So uh, where, wherever you want to, to, to find the optimum of, of something, this is uh, mathematical optimization of mathematical programming uh, as a broad. Uh, as a broad keyword. Uh, and here there's a list of software that you can find. You can find also something in Google uh, for free. There is this uh, MATLAB optimization toolbox. This is really good for non-linear optimization, I would say. Uh, and then we have a free uh, Cplex, uh, uh, Fika Express, and Gurobi. These are really, really good for uh, deterministic and linear uh, continuous or integer. Uh, programming. So for my lecture, I use Fico Express, but these two, uh, maybe Cplex is the most uh, common uh, software. And then we also have Ruby. And then of course we can do something with Excel. So I didn't mention that, but of course the capability, it's completely different, but it's, uh, okay, this is the Italian version, but you can do something with Excel also if you want. You can, uh, you can build a model with the objective function, with constraints and, uh, and so on in, uh, in a very easy uh, way, I would say. Um, so, Oh, sorry, this is not what I want to show. This is a uh, simple, sorry, I didn't want to show that, but you, you can have the links there working and you can have a look if you wish uh, later on. Um, one of the kind of research that we are doing here uh, in Trieste is related to air tra and transport uh, or aviation. And this is a very recent report uh, from a kind of a very important stakeholder. You have Airbus, uh, Canso, Eurocontrol, Ethra Airport, uh, IAT and so on, uh, Thales. Um, and uh, you see that they say uh, European Aviation Artificial, Artificial Intelligence High Level Group 
Um, so the, they want to understand which is the role of uh, AA, uh, artificial intelligence in aviation. AT ATM stands for uh, air traffic management. Uh, and you can see here this nice picture. Uh, you, you have the data. There is a lot of opportunities to exploit this data in airports. Uh, use space means it's an uh, unmanned space of so the drones, basically. Uh, this is air traffic management or air navigation services. And this goes to passengers, um, separation, the, the, the aircraft must be separated, and many, many other things. And one of the things is resource management and optimization. There are many things that you can optimize, uh, both in airports or in air. Uh, and uh, again, this is one of the bricks, uh, one of the building blocks uh, uh, in order to better exploit the, the thing you do, okay? And of course, we have, you have cybersecurity, forecast, predictions, and, and, and so on. So, um, and if you if you go here uh, and here again, and when you talk about resourcing management and optimization, they give you some keyword. So, for instance, the, you want to support the air traffic management demand and capacity balancing. Uh, before the COVID, uh, there was uh, the the supply, so the, the airport infrastructure and the airspace infrastructure uh, in some part of the world and in Europe as well was not able to support, uh, to face the demand. So there's more, more demand for air traffic than uh, what the uh, resources, uh, the infrastructure can accommodate. Uh, okay, now it's completely different because Lufthansa said that probably until 2023, the traffic will not recover, that we're going to fire 20, 22,000 people most likely. So uh, for a few years, it's, uh, this won't be a big issue, uh, even though it, it's recovering, the, the traffic now is recovering after April and May, which was a disaster. And then uh, another thing is deploying the optimal configuration of sectors and optimizing capacity with the available resources. So these are two key points, uh, which are, which were indeed very important and they will be uh, in a very, um, I think very soon, for instance, the, the airport capacity, which is a problem also in the United States, uh, will be again, a, a very demanding task. Um, on, on this, specific issue, uh, specific topics of the optimization to, to, to air transport. Uh, we had in the past a number of uh, uh, basically European projects, uh, which is called uh, H2020 projects. Uh, in bold, we have the project which are running right now. Uh, and these were the past project. You can see that just the name and the um, the name uh, and the period where we run this project here at, uh, at the ORTS lab here in Trieste. Uh, Cesar is basically the, the, um, the European initiative to modernize the air traffic management. This is very much linked with the European Union. It's strictly speaking, it's not sponsored by the European Union, but basically the same thing. Um, and uh, so this, some, of the pro pro some of this project just ended. Uh, while others are going uh, ra running, and this one is uh, going to start uh, next week, so first of July, uh, in two weeks' time. Uh, uh, then we have we are running also uh, an enhanced. Uh, this is an interreg project. This has nothing to do with air transport. We want to uh, here to improve the travel experience with some kind of in um, e-ticketing, intermodal e-ticketing between uh, Italy and and Croatia. So it's again mobility. Uh, smart mobility, if you want uh, mobility as a service, these are kind of keywords. This is not a, this is nothing to do with our transport. It has to do with transportation in general. Um, so, and in this project here, there is plenty. I would say uh, in Vico for sure for you that there, there will be uh, opportunity. We have Andrea uh, Gasparin who's going to defend his uh, thesis, uh, master thesis in July, and uh, on a topic which is very much uh, related. And just to give you a flavor, this, this will be my very last slide uh, on the uh, kind of uh, partners that we have in this uh, in this project. In this project, we don't still have the logo for Beacon because it has to start. We have to, to invent the logo. But besides that, in this in this study, uh, we want to understand how we can prioritize the uh, flights normally. Uh, when there is some congestion, for instance, uh, at landing at an airport, through what is called behavioral economics. And this is very interesting because it, it basically we want to understand what if uh, we don't assume that the actors are rational. So we would like to understand, the, uh, try to incorporate and model in some way also the irrationality of, uh, 
of the agents, okay? So, uh, and which is very much important in many cases. So uh, it's a, if you have the autonomous vehicles and uh, we need to understand that perhaps the, the, um, the pedestrian are, uh, don't behave e always in a rational way. So, uh, and also here, are airlines, of course, airlines, but the, any flights, there is a man behind that. Uh, sometimes the, the kind of decision they take does not seem to follow a completely rational uh, understanding. And we will try to understand how this can be done. And this is called behavioral economics. Uh, and we have Swiss Airlines as a, as a partner and with a list also of uh, five or six other airlines in the uh, advisory board. Um, and this is led by University of Westminster in, in UK. I will send you an email because they are looking from, from two data scientists at the University of Westminster. They have a huge number of uh, European projects there. Um, and Salient and Nomona, uh, which is a, a, a Spanish uh, PM, um, SME. Um, so it's a, it's a Eurocontrol, uh, which is the European Agency for the Safety in Aviation. And these are the other partners for the other projects. So uh, some of them, they are combined. But I would say in the very short term, uh, these kind of possibilities in this uh, European environment uh, uh, to develop some thesis internship uh, and you can also think to go to some of our partners. We have to ask, of course, but you can also think that uh, you can spend uh, uh, some time uh, there, uh, not everywhere. So University of Westminster, they don't really accept people normally, but you can go to Nomon or, or some, some, somewhere else. Uh, I think this would be a possibility that we can explore. So uh, uh, this is my last slide. Um, I think there is time later for questions. I hope I don't have the time. I hope I will, didn't run out of time, but would be uh, all from my side. Something that you would like to ask. Perfect. So thank you, Professor Castelli. So I'll leave the questions for the later session, maybe. Yeah. Um, for for uh, thank you for the interesting presentation. So for those of you who just joined, I just remind you that we'll have a later session around uh, three fifty uh, with all the professors. Then we'll have individual rooms where you can go and talk with them, basically on their those projects that they're presenting. Um, so okay. I don't, okay. I leave the stop share now. So, okay. Yeah. Thank you. Perfect. So just before moving on to the next speaker, just a quick reminder that we're still actively looking for people that jo will join our associations. We've had three new members uh, since last time and we're really happy, but uh, we're really looking forward to see more of you that take the lead and support our initiatives because um, I think this profits everyone and uh, we really hope that some of you will join us and start working together for better events, better projects and those kind of stuff. Okay, so uh, next speaker is a Professor Laura Nancy, uh, which is an assistant professor at the Department of Mathematics and Geoscience at the University of Trieste. Thank you. Uh, so good morning to everybody. Can you hear me well? Yes. Okay, can you see the screen? Yes. Yes. Okay. Um, hi, um, I'm Laura Nancy. Uh, actually, now I'm um, uh, I'm assistant professor uh, at the Department of Mathematics and Geoscience, but now I'm just part time, and uh, the other part of me is in uh, Vienna. So I'm also project assistant part time in Vienna. Uh, since uh, the end of the last year, uh, but most of the time uh, I'm in Trieste. Um, yeah, this is a big, uh, uh, is a, is a, a bit of my path. So I started from biotechnology that I study mathematics and I done the PhD in uh, computer science and, uh, and a postdoc at the TU and now I'm, yes, here and also still at the TU uh, in Vienna. And I'm, uh, as I said, uh, a son, uh, academic son of uh, Luca Bertolucci that uh, made a presentation last week. 
So my work is uh, pretty related uh, with uh, his work. And uh, so part of what I uh, will explain is, is like part of what he explained uh, last week. So um, my, my PhD and my main area of research is uh, to use a logic-based approach to so just to give you an idea what means to use a logic based approach, it means to describe some behavior using uh, some logic formula. So some using a language that has specific operator to describe, for example, the evolution in time of your system. So here, for example, is the evolution in time uh, of an epidemic system where you have uh, individuals who shut the ball and uh, recover um, individual. And uh, you, uh, you want to ask, for example, uh, if uh, this, uh, this trajectory satisfy this property. So if after 50 time units, the number of infected individuals remain less than 30 for at least 50 time units. So this can be described in a formal way using, for example, a, a temporal logic uh, language, a temporal logic. And here is the formula that describes exactly this behavior. Then uh, formal methods uh, comes with the algorithm that can check in an automatic way if your system, or in this case, the trajectory satisfy or not uh, the property. So why this uh, can be really important uh, now uh, for data science and, uh, and machine learning. So the type of system where I'm working on in, in the last uh, years are mainly cyber physical system. So cyber physical system are system that uh, has uh, a cyber component and a physical component. The physical component uh, is uh, something that is measured uh, in the real world. So for example, can be the movement of a car, the level of glucose in uh, the artificial pancreas, uh, the level of the energy. This, this uh, is measured uh, with some sensor. Uh, the, the measure are passed to the cyber part and the cyber part can monitor if these measures are fine or control them. If control them, it means that can change something in, uh, in uh, the physical part using uh, an actuator and, uh, and change the behavior of the physical part. So these are very complex systems that have uh, both a continuous dynamic and a, and a discrete dynamic. So are a very uh, difficult system to, to analyze. And uh, in the last year, there was a, a very huge um, explosion use of, uh, of this system. And in particular, they started to use a lot of machine learning and uh, artificial intelligence in the design of uh, this system. So these are some examples. Uh, some the main application uh, for cyber physical system are uh, medical device or autonomous drive, uh, the drone, uh, and the smart grid, the smart energy system, for example. And one of the main problem of this system is that we need that their uh, safety. And, uh, and this is, uh, sorry, this is, okay. and, um, and this is something that uh, can be very difficult to verify in advance. And uh, there are numerous, numerous paper that showing that using uh, machine learning uh, to design this kind of system, for example, using deep neural network, uh, can easily uh, come to, to fail the system. Uh, 
And uh, there are several examples of fatal accidents involving potential failure of the object detection classification system in self-driving cars. So there is a need in, uh, in the last uh, years to try to design already this system in a safety way. And in, in this and is in this part that uh, the formal verification community started to have a role uh, in this kind of system. So, in uh, broadly speaking, a formal method can be seen as a mathematical algorithm techniques for modeling, design, and analysis uh, uh, complex system. You have to, uh, there are three key words that describe uh, formal verification. One is specification, uh, that means uh, describing what the system must do or must not do. Verification, that means why uh, it means or not uh, the specification. And synthesis, that means how it meets the specification. Synthesis is um, mainly related with study the parameter of your system. And this, uh, the use of formal methods, it was um, have, it was a very like a success uh, methodology uh, for uh, digital circuit design and to to have a safety uh, program. And uh, there is really an increased interest in formal methods also in the industry, and this is something pretty new and uh, and full of challenges. So to give you a better idea, so the idea is that you have a certain model uh, that can be a cyber physical system and uh, you have a, a mainly a simulation of this model because usually these models are very uh, big and so uh, it's difficult to study directly the model but usually what you have is just a simulation of your model. You have a certain environment and you have a certain specification uh, described with the logic. Uh, the formal verification means to check if uh, your system parallelized with the environment satisfy or not uh, uh, the specification. So, um, in, uh, in this area, uh, the formal methods can help in different ways. The first thing is at the specification. So, there are um, already some uh, temporal logic uh, language that uh, can permit to describe as we have seen property as uh, certain properties always true, it's as true at a certain point in the future, but this cannot be enough. So one thing that we are studying, we are studying and I studied a lot during my PhD is uh, if we need other operator to describe, uh, to better describe uh, uh, property of this kind of system. So one part of my work was to uh, design uh, some spatial operator to describe also uh, systems that are distributed in a space. So for example, we designed operator that could describe uh, if uh, from a certain location a uh, uh, property was true if, or if there were a certain number of application at a certain distance from this where the property was true and more complex uh, um, behavior about reachability uh, in the space uh, or uh, surrounded in the space. With, with, with this kind of property you could describe also pattern and, uh, and uh, yes, pattern in the space uh, and for example ev emergency evacuation route. So in this research, we have to, the, the difficult part is to design the monitoring algorithm that given the property and the system permit to check in an automatic way the satisfaction of the property. Uh, another problem uh, that is not the space is the type of property that you can describe with uh, the temporal property. And an, ex very, an example uh, that fits very well is uh, the artificial pranksters that is a medical device and permits to um, you have a, a certain device that uh, uh, inject in an automatic way 
um, the, the insulin and per this permits uh, to keep uh, in the right level of the glucose uh, in a patient uh, with diabetes. So in that case, uh, I don't go in detail, but uh, uh, with the logic that we have until now, you could just describe that something was always true or eventually true. But often what you need is, is uh, to check that something is true in a certain percentage of time. So when, when we were working in uh, some new temporal operator that used the convolution to check uh, mm, that something is true just in a percentage of time and not in an entire inter interval. Okay, I think I have to go faster. So the first part is uh, how we can like specify better this kind of operator if we need a new operator. The second part that is more related with, uh, with data science uh, and machine learning is, uh, okay, we have a certain data, we have a certain uh, system, but we want to learn something uh, from this system that can be readable, no? This is mainly related with explainable AI. So in this, uh, in this kind of research, we are working in minor specification. That means that uh, starting from a set of uh, trajectory, uh, we are trying to find some uh, property that can describe well this set of trajectory. In these uh, in this two systems, we are trying to find uh, some property that can classify between uh, good and bad behavior. So we are using a logic formula as a classificator. And in that uh, work, we use uh, uh, a mix of um, Gaussian process to, to find the parameter of the formula and the genetic algorithm uh, to find the structure of the formula. We are, there is a new work on this that we are doing uh, with uh, Eric Medved and, uh, and a student of data science. We are trying to find the specification of uh, um, mobility uh, of trajectory of the cars uh, in a highway. So we're trying to find what are the rule, the good rule, the good specification uh, for the car to, to drive uh, well uh, in a highway. And uh, the main reason why I'm still also in Vienna is because I'm involved uh, uh, in, a, in a project that is called High Dimensional Statistical Learning, New Methods uh, to Advance Economic and Sustainability Policy. And is a work, uh, is a project joined with uh, uh, the Economic uh, University. And uh, the main idea of this, uh, of this project is to exploit machine learning procedure to reduce the dimensionality of the data and by is an inference to predict the dynamic and formal verification to automatically assess whether the data or the prediction satisfies some specific behavior. So in that part, uh, we are, is the, the third uh, area of my research is that uh, try to exploit is that machine learning inside the, the, the model checking procedure. Because this procedure usually are very, very, uh, can be very um, slow. And uh, we already use uh, machine learning, in particular uh, Gaussian process regression and optimization to uh, speed up uh, the monitoring procedure or the, yes, the, the model checking procedure of this kind of property. But yes, we can go more in detail uh, um, in the in our room if you're interested. So two uh, important uh, um, applications that are um, related uh, with this project and with the uh, formal verification uh, is uh, the possibility to synthesize uh, the parameter of our system and, uh, and to check that uh, the system works well given a certain number of inputs. This, uh, this last one is called falsification, that is that given a certain uh, system, we are going to check different inputs uh, for which the system should still satisfy the property. And we are trying to stress, uh, let's say, the system in a way that uh, 
uh, we uh, we find the tra trajectory that can uh, falsify the property. And related to this is that often we have you are working with systems that uh, have some uh, parameters that are sent are sentent. So you want able to try uh, to study this system even for uh, uncertain parameter. And to do that, you really need uh, to use, uh, to exploit some machine learning techniques that speed up uh, the verification procedure. And last one is that uh, uh, we are starting to try to work uh, in, um, in using uh, SCL inside uh, a control procedure. So the SCL uh, becomes like uh, the, the part that uh, control, uh, choose uh, if uh, the property satisfies or not uh, the, the behavior of the actuator. And we are trying also to um, um, combine this uh, 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 with a system that are described using a reinforcement layer. And I will stop here my presentation. So if you're interested, uh, please come uh, in the room and uh, I will uh, give more detail on some of this spotting. And in the room there will be also, sorry, last thing, uh, the PhD student that is in Vienna and is involved uh, in, uh, in the project uh, there. Thank you. Perfect. So uh, thank you very much, Laura, for, uh, for your presentation. Uh, so I think we can move forward. Uh, just a quick note, if you're interested in knowing more about our other projects or other events, you'll find everything on our website. That's just on the other side here. <laughs> and uh, yeah, so we can move forward. The next uh, speaker is Professor Luca Eltai is an associate professor of numerical analysis at the International School for Advanced Studies in uh, Trieste. Thank you. Okay, so um, hi everybody. Um, <coughs> so I'm also responsible for the Master in App Performance Computing and one of the founder of the Master in App Performance Computing. So what I will be talking about uh, today is uh, some of the, uh, let me just check the time, because otherwise I'm going to feel it. Oh, pressure. Um, so uh, some of the things that we have been working on in the last years are not so much related with, uh, with, uh, with artificial intelligence and machine learning. However, uh, lately we're doing a lot of things that are, that are actually going in uh, very, very, very strongly in that direction. So let's, uh, let me start by telling you what are the projects that we've been uh, working on for the most time. And uh, I'm currently involved in a lot of projects that are related to fluid structure interaction problems. And all of those uh, have been founded by e either ERC grants or uh, European grants, like uh, the ones you see on the slides, or partly with the uh, smaller grants and with the uh, finances from, from, uh, from companies, uh, from local Italian companies and from uh, industrial companies. So for example, some of these guys that you see here, so this is a uh, research project that is ongoing and it's going on with, uh, with the universities in, in, in Berlin. Uh, this part of it here is an ongoing project with, uh, with some companies that uh, uh, produce uh, composite and fiber reinforced materials. While we do vascularized and fiber reinforced tissues and uh, semiconductor devices with, uh, with many other companies. So the range of applications of uh, what we've been working on is, uh, is, is quite large and uh, the topics uh, on which I'm currently working are free structure interaction problems for, for the most part, uh, semiconductor device modeling and numerical simulations of those. And then uh, for all of this, uh, the numerical tools and numerical methods that I currently use are so-called non-matching methods. These are methods for which I will be discussing a little bit more in detail later on. And then physics informed model reduction, in which we try to reduce the complexity of a very difficult problem to solve, like, for example, the brain, uh, the simulation of the physical, the mechanical responses of the brain, uh, using uh, information that we get from uh, either machine learning methods, machine learning techniques, uh, or from, uh, from hypothesis on the model that is happening in the background. And I've been working a lot for, with high performance computing 
and open source uh, and development of open source software for partial differential equations. And in particular, this is uh, everything that you will see in these slides can be reproduced uh, with, with, uh, with the codes we have. Uh, we usually give uh, uh, usually open source for the public. So principal collaborations uh, you can see here. I'm skimming through this very quickly since you have access to the slides after. So this is the main library that I've been working on. So this is an open source library that, uh, that we have developed since uh, last time. So I, 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 I'm one of the main developers and we started developing this. Uh, well, the library started earlier than my involvement uh, in, in 1997 uh, and, and I was involved in 2004. So we've been working on this for quite some time and it has become one of the most uh, relevant uh, libraries for finite elements to simulate. So most of what I will be discussing about today regards uh, applications of machine learnings and uh, uh, applications of artificial intelligence to accelerate uh, finite element solutions of problems uh, of some sort. So to start, uh, just to give you a small background of what we, what we usually do, uh, we discuss about fluid structure interaction problems. This is uh, one of the broadest uh, um, topic of research that we have. And uh, for fluid structure interaction problem, we intend the coupling between a fluid that you should see, well, you don't see any of the fluid here, but you only see what happens as a deformation. So there's a flag behind the cylinder here, and you can actually figure out what the flag here, and it stops at this point. And the rest here is a fluid that is being injected into this channel from the left. So this is a typical fluid structure interaction problem which you couple Navier-Stokes equations, so some nonlinear PDEs in the in the outer domain, with the nonlinear equations that are defined on the actual structure. So this is a type of uh, problems that we would like to solve. And uh, we have been developing several techniques to simplify the solution of these types of problems and to accelerate the solutions to these types of problems. So first of all, the technique, uh, one of the techniques on which I've developed most of my career was the immersed boundary methods or immersed methods techniques. This is a technique that is used to simulate complex coupling problems between two different domains and two different types of physics uh, using a fixed regular breakdown grid for, for, for one of the two domains and then overlapping this with non-matching uh, technique, with non-matching triangulations and grids on, on, on front of those types of things. So if you do it this way, uh, the advantages are that you don't need to uh, match the model, the discretizations as you have seen in the previous slides, uh, but you can uh, let basically the foreground grid be independent with respect to the background grid. And this is the type of simulations that we, that we are interested in for, for these types of problems. So for example, if you see it this year, uh, this is a standard benchmark that is solved with these type of problems and uh, you get uh, exactly the type of results that you would expect. But if you look at the way that this is obtained with respect to the first slide that I showed, that I've shown, uh, then what you see is that there is a fixed background grid that actually simulates the solid, the, the fluid dynamics, plus a, the area in which there is an artificial uh, PD that is being sold, which is the area that overlaps between the two. And then on top of that, you have the solution of the classical and elasticity problem. So this type of equations is, uh, uh, this, is, this type of problems requires a lot of details. So for example, you have to figure out exactly where all of these points figure, figure, fall in, 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 in between the, to the, uh, the, the domain, and this is uh, usually called particle in cell uh, type of uh, approximations, particle in cell methods, in which you need to figure out where millions of particles or millions of positions, millions of points, millions of quadrature points uh, end up being in a simulation in a simulation domain. And this can be accelerated very much with uh, with, uh, with the deep neural network and uh, can be accelerated with uh, smart uh, machine learning techniques. So, and this is exactly the topic of the latest research that we're doing. Uh, I'll just keep the references here for you to, to, to read and get access to this. So if you do need more information about uh, interfaces, or if you want to do uh, something slightly different with respect to what, I, what I've shown here, so for example, free surface problems, then you may be also interested in different types of uh, discretization. So uh, in this case, I'll sh I'm showing what we have done for uh, in the past or, uh, for example, for Fink and Thierry. So this was a project that was uh, developed together with uh, Chitena and Fink and Thierry. And uh, in this, uh, this application, the idea is that uh, we have a, um, a, a hull. And we want to understand how this, uh, how this behaves and what is the total resistance of the hull. And we want to be able to simulate exactly the type of things that you see here in the back for the fluid dynamics and for the structure. So you want to be able to stimulate the coupling between the two and to give uh, ideas of what changes if you change the shape of the hull and how to optimize the actual shape of the hull. 
So this was a very complex problem. And so the way that we tackled this was to actually reformulate everything in terms of boundary elements methods, so integral additions. And, and you see our results here. And uh, the interesting part of these types of solvers and this type of methods is that uh, uh, they compare very well with the experimental results. So if you take a look, for example, here, we have four lines in which we uh, take a slice of our numerical simulations and we compare this with the results we've seen in the um, metal sink. And, uh, in, in, and as you see here, the results compare in, in an exceptionally good way with respect to our experiments. And this is uh, the star are the results of our simulations and the, light, the red lines are the results of the, of the experiments that have been done on, on, on the laboratory. And the final curve that was of interest for thinking theory and for, for the commuter in this, in this case was actually the curve of the total resistance with respect to the speed of the boat. And if you can produce these curves with, uh, with enough, uh, fast enough, and uh, in order to be able to do this, you need to, to incorporate uh, a lot of machine learning techniques into your you know, methods and tools, then uh, this, this type of simulation techniques can be used uh, efficiently by, by Fingenkeri or by whoever uh, wants to use these types of, sort of, of techniques, uh, say, in a, in a close to real time uh, simulation. So this was done for two main projects that have been not, uh, finished. So uh, these are open sheep and open sheep, but we still have open lines of research in that direction to get it also with the first and uh, with the group of groups. So, this last part instead is a very nice, uh, uh, simple example of a uh, still fluid structure interaction problem. So where machine learning enters in an unexpected way. So in this problem, for example, this is a uh, microorganisms that actually swims in our seas, in the Arctic seas, is called the Uglena. And this video is taken from YouTube. And we, we wanted to understand exactly how physically this was going, how was happening. So how is this? moving why is it moving in this way and what is actually doing in this case because this this organism also has a tail in this case but it doesn't use the tail to swim in this specific motion so in this specific motion what happens is that this is called metabolic and it's a um, movement that the euglena does in specific locations and not only so it's, it wasn't it wasn't clear why this was happening so we, we tried to study this from the numerical point of view and machine learning came into to help in a, in a very profound way. So let's put it, let's, let's start and I'll, I'll just walk you through what happened in this particular case. So in this case, we have, uh, we simplified the problem a little bit from a mathematical point of view by assuming that the shape was a nearly asymmetric. That we could say this because if you take a look at the at different frames, uh, the, you know, the horizontal shape, so the cut always looks the same, but the thing is, so the dot that you see here after one stroke is a pin here, and then the other dot that you see here after one stroke is ended up here. And this we obtain by following the various uh, tracking the various points. So in, in, if you look at this, this is a, a roughly the same uh, same object, the same shape that we have here. So we can simplify everything and say, well, this is roughly axisymmetric. Once you have done this. Uh, well, it's difficult to, 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 to construct uh, numerical simulations of this guy. So the, the two you really need to do, the thing that you really need to do are uh, a segmentation of the image first. So that's what you see on the upper right corner here. After you then segmentation of the image, you have to recalibrate and to perform efficiently numerical simulations that are that are good for, for, for the analysis. So we need something more intelligent. And the way that we proceed was to actually take the movies frame by frame and apply a trivial and very simple nonlinear isomath techniques to, to do some manifold learning techniques to construct uh, to, to embed the, the movement of the, of, the, of the swimmer and try to figure out what is exactly the essence of the swimmer in this case. And, and there's a nice couple of things that come out from, from this analysis. So first of all, the analysis tells us that uh, the actual dimension of the manifold that is being explored when you swim is a one-dimensional manifold. So it's, it's an object that has uh, the dimension of a line. And however, if you, if you look at it as a one line dimensional manifold, you, you lose information about what is going to happen. So if you look at it with the, with the two dimensions being extracted, isomap pretends to you a first curve. 
And this coincides with the theory of the uh, holomorphic and non-holomorphic constraints. And you, I mean, you can do a lot of uh, uh, interesting mathematics behind this, but the interesting part of this is that by using manifold learning techniques, you construct a way to uh, produce synthetic strokes that can actually be used to perform the analysis and to perform the, the numerical simulations in a much cleaner way. And this is exactly what we have done in this, in this type of problems. And also, uh, what, what happens is that if you observe uh, non linearized map, and then you ask again, for example, what happens if you try to embed this in a three dimensional space? But what you get in the three dimensional space is that the third direction is really not that important, but it has a meaning, which is a, a very interesting meaning from the physical point of view. And this is what triggered uh, all the research that followed from, the, from, from this work, which was a very nice, uh, nice work. So in principle, when you, when you do this type of information, you obtain uh, some, some, uh, some uh, general information about the dimensionality of the space where the actual swimmer is swimming. Uh, and the dimensionality that is the analysis that is show is shown here tells you that the dimensionality is actually two. So you can think of this dimensionality to be the, the, the formation of a bulge uh, or the position of the bulge when, when it is formed. So the bulge is the, the rounded part of the C here. So you, you, you may roughly associate the, 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 the two parameters with the uh, bulge pre being present or not, or bulge being in the front or bulge being in the back. So if you, if you look at this, rotating around this, uh, this circle, you will see that when you're on the left, the, the bulge is not present. When you're, uh, when you're on the left, the bulge is on the left. When you're on the right, the bulge is on the right. When you're on the bottom, the bulge is not present. When you're on the top, the bulge is very large. Roughly, this is uh, what comes out. So if you do this, and then you couple this with the structural interaction problems using standard uh, finite element analysis, and uh, uh, our, basically, most of our research was dedicated on this time, you can actually figure out what is the efficiency of the swimmers and what they are currently doing and, and formulate a hypothesis on what is actually happening at the microscopic level to these guys. And one of the interesting things is that we figure out from the numerical analysis and from the analysis of these things that in reality, the swimmer is doing a lot more than that, that meets the eye. So there's a lot of things that are happening in the background and we can discuss about this if you're more interested after. So this is a result of the uh, final simulation. So on the left you had the actual swimmer and on the right we have our numerical simulations and we can uh, reproduce basically uh, roughly all the, 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 the most important physical techniques properties of the things, also the uh, surface, uh, the surface deformations of the, of the bulge for different types of handles of the equipment. So this is a, uh, an example we need to see four different types of swimmers. And you have that the swimmer on the right is the faster one, and the ones that are, are faster are the ones that are able to produce the bulge and the bulge in the bottom. This is like a, a, a frog style swimming in a certain sense. You, you, you produce something that has much resistance on the top and you move it on the bottom and then you come back and there's something which is less resistant. This is uh, important, especially if you know, if you swim and low on standards. This is one part of the thing. So this is uh, the references for this part of the research. And the part that is now uh, the most recent part of the research is the one that is uh, mechanical modeling of living tissues. And uh, ideally, so if you, if you want to think about the type of uh, uh, very complex living tissue, so that, we, that we're discussing about, you can think about the brain tissue. So brain tissue is made of uh, three different types of materials. It's very complex, it's very rich from the geometrical point of view, and it's very rich from the modeling point of view. So this is nonlinear linear vista elastic material, which is anisotropic and inhomogeneous, and it is fluid separated. So there's a lot of details here that can go wrong when you try to simulate these types of guys. But in, in principle, moreover, you have also that this is immersed in a moving cerebrospinal fluid. So there's a, it's as if it was immersed in a bulge of, of fluid that acts as a cushion and as a, and as a protection for, for this type of uh, material. It's perfused with pulsating blood vessels. So there's a lot of vasculature inside there that is pulsating with, uh, with active blood vessel. And it's also um, enriched with a lot of the fibers that are actually passive fibers from a mechanical point of view, but are the one that actually bring information about the uh, activations of the parts of the brain. So what you see here is a conic tone. So it's actually the, the picture of how the various uh, axons and neurons are connected between each other. So this is very nice. And uh, for example, one of the interesting things is to try to figure out what is the collective behavior from a mechanical point of view of the full brain when you take into account all of these types of things. So if you want to do this locally and uh, with the full resolution, you cannot do that. So what we have been doing in the past is trying to um, replace this type of uh, full 
pledge the informations with one dimensional information for fibers and vasculatures and to overlap those inside the white matter exactly as this for the normal So these types of uh, simulations are, are very interesting and uh, what we expect is to see different behaviors if you consider live matters and uh, alive tissues rather than dead tissues. So if you actually take uh, experiments and look at the experiments in this, uh, in this type of, uh, uh, of things, what you observe is that if you take a live, um, some estimation from, from, from live patients of, of the elasticity is that there are techniques that are non-invasive techniques that allow you to give some answers on how the, uh, the, 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 the mechanical behavior of the material is. Those uh, estimations are very far away from the estimations that you get when you analyze the tissues from, from, from dead tissues. Like, for example, if you have a, a brain and you actually try to, to, to check and to control how the mechanical behavior of brains. So this discrepancy can be explained by the fact that there is a vasculature that has active pressure in there, that has active blood pressure in there. It's like, so the, the effect is the same as if you take a, a hose of water and you and you fill it up with water at high pressure but the elasticity of the, of the hose is different with respect to the elasticity of an empty of a hollow hose that doesn't have water in there and so this is the type of principle that we want to have however there's an issue here and the issue is that we do not we do not know how to reconstruct in a realistic way in a proper way the vasculature and the axonal behaviors of of the patients uh, of the various uh, structural limitations. So one of the things in which the artificial intelligence can come into place is to reconstruct the vasculature and to give some evidence in this case. So this is what we are currently doing for, for these types of applications. And if you're interested, uh, one of the latest projects you will be able to, to, to listen to is that this is by Yuri Kikoni, Kikoni and uh, he's doing accelerating particle insert methods, which are the methods that are used for this non-matching non techniques to actually do the numerical simulations of this, all of these non-matching techniques and uh, is this is an accelerating these types of methods using deep neural networks. So the other things that we are currently doing is trying to analyze the MRI data using machine learning techniques and uh, the idea is to uh, use very quick uh, to do numerical simulations to provide uh, to, to provide data to during the, the, the deep neural networks and to train deep neural networks with data which is simulated from the computer, and then uh, using these simulations to uh, simulations to actually reconstruct uh, the experimental data. And so uh, I think I'll stop here. And uh, if you have any questions, you you'll find me in the room on the other side. So thank you, Professor Heltai, for the presentation. So as Professor Heltai said, uh, we'll have the uh, meet and greet session after uh, the whole event for those of you who just joined. And now we'll move to uh, Professor Luca Manzoni, who is an assistant professor at the Department of Mathematics and Geoscience at the University of Trieste. Thank you. Thank you for uh, the introduction. And uh, I would now start in this short presentation. It will be um, a short introduction to the different uh, topics where, uh, of my research. And they, are, uh, they all have something in common that is. They are based on balanced by computation, that is taking inspiration from nature to solve real problems and to perform computations. So we start with evolutionary computation. What is evolutionary computation? And, by the, and uh, the other big part that is discrete dynamical systems. From, the, from evolutionary computation, I will talk about genetic programming, which is my main topic of research and uh, the highly related the genetic algorithm but also i started the collaboration collaboration of, which involved the use of particle volume optimization and uh, strangely something about music also and for a discrete dynamical system i started working with cellular automata then i moved to my brain computing and to a more recent model called, uh, inspired uh, by biochemical action, called the action system. So, 
the title with some background. This was already said in the first presentation by uh, Professor Castelli. What is an optimization problem? There is some slight change in terminology. We have a solution space, a set of solutions to our optimization problem, but they are not all the same with respect to quality. So we have a fitness function that maps our solution to a measure of quality of the solution. And we want to find the optimal. It could be the minimum or the maximum among all the possible solutions with respect to uh, the fitness function. Unfortunately, in many real world cases, we cannot perform an exhaustive search among all the solutions, or we may not even know a exact algorithm to find a solution. So we may decide to use uh, some um, heuristic or actually meta heuristic to find good enough solutions. And uh, among the uh, very large number of possible meta heuristics, and uh, we want to take inspiration from a process that has started billions of years ago and is still going on, that is natural evolution. So we want to modify our solutions if they were individuals inside an ecosystem and they are evolving with time, improving with time. So what does it mean? This means that we start with a population it is a set of solutions that may be good, may be bad. Well, we decide if we have found a solution that is for us good enough. If not, we perform the equivalent of natural selection. Well, we, uh, we decide which individuals, which solution are the best ones and they, they are the more, uh, they, once they are adapted more to the environment and they can proceed to the next step, that is the step of crossover or reproduction. That is where we mix solution to find new solutions. And then we have a step of the mimics natural mutations with as more probability change the characteristic of our solution. And then we have two possibilities. We still, uh, we have found a good solution good enough, and then we can stop, or we proceed again. Each iteration is a generation. If you think about what happened in network, we have a regeneration where the individual is selected, the individual is produced, and then we have a new generation, and everything starts again. And we continue to improve at every step. And the different evolutionary algorithms differs from the way we represent the solutions. And for genetic programming, we use three uh, representation of solution as trees that can represent programs, expression, and so on. For example, this tree represents the expression three plus x2 plus x1 squared. But this is not the only representation if it is the most used. We have a Cartesian GP, where solution as uh, are represented as graphs. And we have, uh, for example, linear GP, where solution are represented as a linear sequence of simple instructions, which are executed one after the other. So how genetic programming works? Suppose that we start with a collection of individuals. They are our starting population. We select the best ones. We exchange part of a solution by exchanging some trees to mimic production and to have the, a new generation of children. And they can also be mutated with a small probability. So, this one is the new generation, the new set of solutions, and then we will start again until we have found a solution that is good enough. So what uh, I'm working on, I'm working on with 
on genetic programming, well, one important topic of research is semantic genetic programming. It is uh, the study of uh, the evolutionary process of genetic programming as a series of operation of the metric space. This is not the usual genetic programming, this is slightly different and has very interesting theoretical properties. I have just started a project of working on natural language processing using genetic programming. We had the first preliminary results. It seems uh, quite uh, good in the use of creating language models with GP. Uh, they have both advantages and disadvantages with respect to uh, other more complex models. But I think they are worth to be investigated. Then we have a generation of music with evolutionary algorithms. This is a collaboration with uh, the Instituto Mojay in Pavia, where they use uh, and study music therapy, for example, to uh, limit the uh, work-related stress. And uh, the gen automatic generation of music can be very useful in this case. And then we have the extension of genetic programming to include other methods. For example, the, um, Alessia Pauletti is working on uh, integrating uh, semantic genetic programming with uh, gradient descent to combine so a method coming from mainly used in uh, the training of neural networks inside genetic programming. And there is a lot of way that genetic programming should uh, and could be extended. And now moving quickly to a collaboration that started just last year with uh, well, people from the Netherlands and also from uh, Milan and uh, Belgium. There is a uh, particle optimization and the uh, idea of surrogate models that is uh, supposed that we want to find the minimum of this quite rugged function. We can actually find the minimum, not of this function, but of a simplified model by using um, actually the Fourier transform to filter in some sense the function. We found we find the solution, the optimal solution for the surrogate problem, and then we go back to the original problem, but we, with the solution that we found for the surrogate problems, and usually this means that we are a lot. Uh, we have a lot of good solutions to start with to solve the original problem, and it can be faster than um, attacking directly the original problem. This has been used with particles volume optimization, that is another uh, optimization method, but can actually be used for a lot of other optimization algorithms, for example, also in uh, genetic programming. Moving to more theoretical side of the research, I'm also interested in the perform research on a discrete dynamical system, where we have a set of states and a transition function that move from one state to the next. What does it mean? We have the time that is modeled in a discrete way. The time is discrete, we have to step zero to step one and not in a continuous way, like when you model a, a phenomenon with uh, uh, differential equations. In this case, everything is discrete. And there are a lot of interesting behavior that we can find, for example, fixed point cycles, or the transient that goes into fixed point cycles. And uh, this genetic framework can actually be used to model a lot of real world phenomena. And uh, a study, this time with uh, a friend and colleague of mine that is currently working in Marseille in France, is the definition of operation of composition of a discrete dynamical system as sum and products, where the sum represents the exclusive execution, 
we like to execute one system or the other. And Protocol presents a parallel execution of two, the, of the two um, uh, systems. By defining some products, we can define polynomials and polynomial equations. Why are they interesting? Well, because we can define it with polynomial equations uh, actually a way to find the unknown part of a phenomenon of uh, a model that we have only partially. That is, we have model part of a more complex system. We have an unknown part. We can try to constrict the unknown part with a set of equations of the discrete dynamical systems. And there are a lot of in this case of open question related to factorization that is we can decompose the system in more than one way the composition is not unique solving equations and which equation can we solve efficiently with application also to as i said to the world phenomena for example we have two models for the same phenom uh, phenomenon since the master present the same phenomenon, we can make a construction of the equation to say they must work the same, and we can use this equation to find some part of some unknown part of the models, and also the problem of synthesis. That is, we have a lot of real world observation of a phenomenon. So can we how can we construct efficiently a system that can uh, explain this phenomenon. And part of this family of discrete dynamical system are cellular automata, which is one of the oldest network spike computational models dating back to Ulam and von Neumann between the uh, fifth, uh, in the 50s. The base unit of the system is very simple, is a single cell that can um, it is a finite state automaton, so they can assume only a limit, finite number of states, and it can update its state basis based on a neighborhood. So only a limited, the cell can see only a limited number of neighboring cells, and we can codify the update of the cell in a, actually in a table in a finite table and uh, we can combine more cells and say all the cell updates at the same time so this this model is very simple where it is a component that are very simple but the behavior can be very complex for example if we start with the configuration where all the cells are in the state blue and only one cell in the, is in the state pink and we use the, the transition function specified in the previous slide, we have that if we go on with time, we obtain some kind of discretization the, of the CIP or the fractal known as the CIP triangle. We can formalize this. Uh, the fact that this is some discretization of the CIP triangle, which is not a uh, very easy say behavior. It's actually quite complex behavior. So we have is, uh, simple components that can create very complex behavior. So we can ask what are the what is the complexity of the side if certain behaviors exist? Or even if they can be computed and if we have something simple that can create complex behavior, can we use it in cryptography, for example, as some kind of primitive in cryptography? Actually, there are a lot of uh, other applications and open problems in automata that has been used in a lot of real world applications, for example, uh, here, uh, to model, uh, to perform some uh, fluid dynamic simulations uh, for uh, Ile Cafe. Uh, I think uh, more, than, more than 10 years ago. Well, uh, 
the idea was to model how water moves between the grains of coffee. And going up to the other, other discrete dynamical models, there are reaction systems that are inspired by bare chemical reactions that happens in cells. They uh, are a simplification of chemical reactions when we have each reaction that is composed of reactants that are necessary for reaction to happen. Products that are used, that are produced by a reaction when the reaction can happen. And inhibitors that can block a reaction. So if we have a set of chemical substances and we have all the reactants and all the inhibitors, a reaction produce all the products. And if we have more than one reaction, we apply all of them at the same time. So we start with an initial set of entities, we create a new set of ke uh, chemical entities, and so on and so on. Still a discrete dynamical system. And we can ask a lot of questions about the, its dynamics. How can we interact with it? What, what kind of real world behaviors can we model? with this kind of simplified system. And we can also ask the same question as we said on automata, how can we decide if a set of dynamical behavior exists? What are the restrictions that we can impose on our action systems without diminishing the ability to model and to compute? And question about the synthesis. We have a series of observations how can we create a reaction system that was dynamics match the observation? And then which kind of world model we can, uh, real world phenomena we can model? There are some models of generic time networks uh, and uh, or some chemical action, uh, chemical networks, uh, chemical action networks and so on. But what are the best ways to model uh, how to move from one model to another. And finally, I also worked on membrane computing, which is also based on the idea of biochemical action inside the cells, except that now uh, the chemical entities are inside the membranes, mimicking uh, cellular membranes. And uh, these membranes can be can permeable, so objects and chemical objects can move between two membranes and they can perform mitosis and the objects that are contained inside the membranes and they can uh, be subject to chemical action and are duplicated by mitosis and they can move between membranes. Why is this computational model interesting? Well, because if we look by performing mitosis multiple times, we can simulate by using exponential space an exponential number of computations in parallel. So it is a computational model that is inherently parallel and massively parallel. So how can we harness this ability to perform a lot of computations at the same time? Well, we must study the role of communication. So how membranes must communicate to allow to actually solve problems efficiently. I think like one of the questions is called the conjecture because if we restrict too much the communication, it is conjecture that we are only able to solve problems in beam polynomial time, but currently the best upper bound found by uh, me and my colleagues were, uh, was a few days ago to video to shy P that is beyond NP, if you know about complexity classes, and a lot of questions about theoretical computer size uh, and particular complexity classes just below this space. With this, I have concluded. Uh, thank you for your attention and see you at the meet and greet. So thank you very much, Professor Manzoni. And uh, now we'll move uh, to the last presentation. So last but not least, we have uh, Leonardo Egidi. Uh,
He's a postdoctoral researcher at the Department of Statistics, uh, Bruno De Finetti of the University of Trieste, and he's also teaching the course of uh, uh, statistical methods for data science at the DSSC Master. Thank you. So thank you, Gabriele. Thank you for your really nice uh, initiative, your association for inviting me. So yes, I'm going really, I will be quick. I just, I don't want to steal more time. I mean, uh, for those who are interested, we can meet on the meet and greet with really a nice, uh, a nice uh, really meeting and uh, an initiative. So briefly, who I am? I guess I met many of you during the course, during the courses actually. So I'm a postdoctoral researcher in uh, uh, statistics, uh, in the statistics department, uh, and also an adjunct professor of statistical methods and data science. I got my PhD in statistics in 2018. Usually uh, I like to match program in uh, R, so I'm an R package developer, and uh, I'm currently also an elected member of the Young CIS, which is the young chapter of the CIS. So maybe uh, some of you attended the Stat Talk 2019 that we organize in the Unity S. Uh, I have some open collaborations that maybe can be joyful and maybe fruitful for uh, for some of you. Maybe if we, uh, if uh, some of you maybe wants to agree to make a, maybe an open collaboration on some data sets on some uh, statistical projects. So quickly, which are my research fields? So I have to say I am, let's say, a statistician. So. I'm currently working on both theoretical aspects of statistics and applied aspects of statistics. Usually, I'm a Bayesian statistician, so um, one of my main research fields is Bayesian mixture models. In a while, I'm going to tell you why Bayesian mixture models are a so hot topic. Another kind of uh, uh, field is uh, the specification of obvious prior distribution in Bayesian inference. So, for those of you who already know something about Bayesian inference, you know that uh, uh, Bayesian inference is very, very attractive, computationally uh, quite um, effective, and of course you need to specify both the likelihood of your model and also the prior distribution for your parameter, uh, ending up in having the posterior distribution for your parameter. Another kind of field, this is more applied, this is quite, uh, uh, I mean, appreciated maybe more by, by men, but also maybe by some females, so I love to use statistics to model sports data and particularly football data. Uh, so one of the reasons why I like this, it's because we can use, I can use statistics uh, in some sense also to infer characteristics over uh, football matches or volleyball matches. Still, I'm not going to, I'm not working in basketball for instance, but I'm very, very able to work also in bas basketball data because I know that there are very, very nice data there. I'm also working in Robbie's K-means clustering initialization, and uh, uh, I have an open, open collaboration in the University of Pavia about uh, Bayesian mandolin randomization. This is more a sort of biostatistician, biostatistics topic. Uh, I love hierarchical models, so uh, I guess hierarchical models are quite uh, very, very useful and big tool to model data. I like to use uh, hierarchical models under a Bayesian flavor, but I mean, not only restricted to a Bayesian flavor. So I push myself to use only images. I just want to have this, just want to spend this uh, five, seven minutes just by using images. I guess it's not so easy because usually uh, statisticians and machine learners use many, many formulas. I don't want to use formula. I want just to spend many, uh, I, I just want to spend uh, a few words about these graphs. So basically in these images, in the first row, you find what is the so-called label switching phenomenon in Bayesian mixture models. So in Bayesian mixture models, if you perform Marco chain Monte Carlo techniques, the Marco chain Monte Carlo is likely to switch and in some sense to be not identified in correspondence of the mixed labels of your mixture distribution. So that's the reason why you need an algorithm to, in some sense, relabel, to rearrange uh, your uh, mixture label uh, parameters. So that's the reason why we developed uh, in this paper of 2018 an algorithm, a relabeling algorithm, to, in some sense, to rearrange all these switches which arise in the trace plot of Bayesian mixture models. So this is a typical, uh, very hot topic in Bayesian mixture models. Many authors work on that, so I guess there, I mean, there are also many algorithms. So I don't think that many algorithms more are going to, uh, let's say, to 
uh, to come in the next future. But anyway, I'm open to investigate more advanced also in this kind of field. Another, let's say, uh, another uh, applied field uh, in which uh, mixture models and Bayesian mixture models, especially for what concerns model-based clustering, can be very, very useful is uh, for, uh, in some sense, using some data like the commuting flows in an Italian regions, in this case, in Friuli, Venezia, Giulia, to form and to build new possible sub-regions. So this was something which was requested by the Friuli, Venezia, Giulia uh, government. Uh, they were asking for, in some sense, to redefine possibly and eventually new possible sub-regions uh, according to the commuting flow in all the regions. So we collected all the data, we built a statistical model, and in some sense, we ended up to run a mixer model with nine groups uh, in some sense redefining possible new sub-regions within the uh, canonical four regions, four uh, provinces of uh, Friuli Venezia Giulia. Um, as I told you, I work in a Bayesian context, so another very, uh, another topic which I'm quite involved is uh, specifying Robius prior distribution. So this plot alone is not so maybe significant for you because of course this is related to a typical uh, data set, but uh, this in some sense suggesting that we need often we need to form and to specify prior distribution which should be generative for our models. So usually Bayesian statisticians work with the so-called non-informative prior distribution or very vague diffuse prior. So this is often not uh, the case for obtaining proper posterior distribution and for obtaining useful estimates. So in some sense, uh, we try to specify a class, a particular class of mixed prior distribution to have a sort of, uh, let's say, more robust prior specification, especially in small sample size. When the sample size of my model is uh, maybe it's not so big. I know that usually people talk about big data, but usually this is not often the case. Uh, many times maybe the, samples, the sample size is not big, maybe it's small or something like uh, comparable to small. So in those cases, specifying a prior can have a very, very big influence on the inferential conclusions. So that's the reason why maybe sometimes we need to focus on obvious prior distribution. And here is maybe something which is more funny. So we developed some models in terms of uh, uh, football to specify, for instance, uh, probabilities for uh, winning matches. So basically this is a sort of uh, uh, plot for the two finals of the World Cup 2018, France against Croatia and Belgium against England. See, here again, the approach is a Bayesian approach. So basically these are posterior probabilities and the dark region are associated with most likely results. So the red square is in association with the absurd result, so 4-2 for France, and darker region are associated with more likely results according to the model. As you can see here, the 4-2 result was quite, let's say, unlikely under the Bayesian model, whereas the 2-0 uh, in Belgium and England was in some sense more likely according to the Bayesian model. So, this is just an explicative plot. This is just something to illustrate what are, uh, which are the uh, some uh, attractive and maybe uh, useful uh, plots when dealing with the football models, but many of them can be uh, reached. Uh, in volleyball also, uh, we can also use volleyball data to make predictive models for, in some sense, predicting who will be winner of uh, volleyball league, or in some sense to make some predictions be between the different teams. So, for instance, uh, on the left plot, you can find the estimated abilities with a confidence interval. Actually, these are credibility intervals because, again, we are framing a Bayesian inference. So, for the uh, Italian uh, league 2017 2018, if I'm not wrong, so these are estimated from the data. Whereas this is the pattern of the predicted rank for the uh, 14 teams of the Italian league. So as you can see here, black points, uh, which are in some sense overlapped by these blue points, I'm not going in detail with this, uh, with this point, but the points in the plot basically are the absurd point for the final ranks. Instead, the red ribbons correspond to the predicted rank. So as you can see here, by using just the mid half, the first half of the season to predict the second half of the season, 
we are able in some sense to make very good prediction because only one of these points is far from the red ribbon. So just uh, the final points for Padova in this case are far from the red ribbon. So this is a particular case in which we use the posterior uncertainty of my parameters to depict which will be the final rank of the distribution. Uh, going to the clustering uh, uh, field, uh, we are going to, uh, with, with, us, uh, with other professors in, uh, in, uh, in my department, and with, uh, uh, with uh, Nicola Torelli, Francesco Paoli, Roberto Papada, we developed a so-called so Robius k-means clustering. Uh, for those of you who are familiar with k-means, you know that k-means is not initialized. So basically the k-means uh, starts uh, in a random way. So you are not going to fix the seedings, the initial seeds where the k-means clustering can start. This is basically something that can be uh, quite not efficient because of course many times you need maybe to fix the initial seedings and this is what is called as k-means plus plus. Uh, k-means plus plus was born uh, 13, 14 years ago. We in some sense extended, we reviewed the k-means plus plus approach by fixing through some pivotal methods the initial uh, the initial seeds of the k-means clustering and basically if this is true data this is the k-means usually usual approach and as you can see the k-means usual approach is not able to recognize here uh, let's say the true group allocation whereas the moose k-means which is basically the name of the algorithm for this kind of algorithm for this kind of approach is able basically starting from very well specified uh, pivotal units to use these pivotal units and to recognize the right allocations of the groups. And the same happens in this other uh, simulated data set with just two uh, groups, so the gray one and the red one. And at the end, uh, due to that pandemic crisis that we, we had in these months, uh, we developed some Bayesian hierarchical models for COVID-19 uh, intensive care units. So I guess that uh, those of you who, were, um, who attended the course of statistical methods and data science this year already had a glimpse about this. Anyway, for those of you who are interested, you can go on, on my website and see what we have uh, done. Still, we are working on this data, but hopefully, I mean, the worst is, uh, is gone. So let's, let's hope to forget about this data in a while because this would mean that we are in a very better period. So anyway, we are in some sense uh, going to study more this, uh, this data and of course we want to use this data more, even if data from Protezione Civile website have many problems in terms of biasness, in terms of uh, um, cleaning of the data. So let's see, let's see what happens uh, in the next month, but we are open also for a master thesis in this kind of application. Okay, I'm going to finish. I just want to put very, very lucid if possible on going in future projects for both master students and PhD students. So for master thesis, uh, for instance, a possible application, this is not an exhaustive list, this is just a possible list of applications. But for instance, for master thesis, uh, a master student could, for instance, go ahead with simple and more advanced predictive model for football, volleyball and basketball. And for this purpose, uh, I'm going to develop the food bias package in R. So maybe some students could also uh, give an help uh, for this package and maybe also uh, in some sense collaborating for this, uh, for this new package. Uh, another possible application is hierarchical models for political pulse data. So usually uh, political, uh, political data are quite useful. I mean, there, there are many, many political polls so for instance, my master thesis some years ago was about uh, political pulse data. So maybe uh, we can also try to extend some existing approaches. And then of course, some uh, COVID-19 applications. So there is, uh, there is one student now, uh, which is going to, um, which is going to uh, have the have master thesis about COVID-19 uh, uh, data sets. So uh, I'm very open to work with the COVID-19 application for master thesis. Then I'm, more, I'm all, also listing some possible widest, uh, wider projects for PhD students. Uh, maybe there are not PhD students uh, attending this seminar, but I guess it can be quite also useful also to list some possible projects. So again, uh, there is the possible development of the food bias package with many possible graphical and technical details. Uh, 
uh, still there is an ongoing research about this pivotal middle superclustering that I show in the, in the slides. So uh, I guess that that kind of field can be very, very uh, hot in the, in, the, in the next year. So in some sense, finding pivotal middles to in some sense be uh, more efficient in, in clustering. And also, uh, there are many advanced sports modeling techniques, not only statistical models, not only pure statistical models, but also, for instance, machine learning algorithm, neural nets, and also comparing predictive accuracies between pure statistical models such as Poisson distribution or a multinomial distribution with some, uh, uh, let's say, let's see more machine learning methods such as neural nets, uh, random forests, and, uh, and what else. So, uh, thank you for the attention. Here there are some references. Anyway, for, who is, uh, for whoever is interested, Let's meet in a while in the meet and greet uh, session. Thank you, guys. So thank you, Professor Egidi. So um, yeah, and thank everyone who attended this session. We really hope that uh, this was useful both for uh, speakers and for attendees. So how this is going to work now, basically, it's like last time for those who were there. So now uh, one of my collaborators, uh, Kertana, is going to post on the chat the link to uh, the, the meet and greet page that we created where you can find all the links basically uh, to the individual sessions with professors. Uh, so if you visit the page, you're going to see a big image with all doors and faces of the speakers and you just have to click on the respective door that you're interested into and this will lead you to the session. There's also a door for us because we have a session going on uh, about like information about the master program in general and also about the associations. So if you want to come to chat, we're, we're there for you. Um, so we're gonna keep open like last time this session uh, in case uh, something works badly uh, so let's try the link and if it doesn't work, please come back and just mention it to us so that we can handle it uh, in another way. Thank you. Um,